digital identity. The circular product data protocol is the shared language for digital identification of products in the circular economy in fashion and retail. And we're going to tell you a little bit more today about what it is and how to use it. And we have some special panelists with us today as well. We can go to the next slide, Julie. So before we get started, again, I want to say welcome. We're really, really glad that you're here to learn more about the protocol. And I also just want to say thank you. Thank you to all those companies and all the people who have contributed endlessly to this protocol. Uh, we kicked off in 2018 with the Circular ID initiative to develop the protocol. The members of the Circular ID initiative were closed loop partners, Target, PVH Core, Microsoft, GS1 US, Waste Management, Renewal Workshop, Four Days, ICO, IDO, Sustainable Apparel Coalition were contributors to the protocol, the Open Apparel Registry, RISE Research Institute of Sweden, Revolve Waste, CERC, and there are so many others who contributed to the protocol, especially in its early days. I also want to thank some of our pilot partners, Target, Yuxnet Porte, Zalando, Pangaya, Gabriela Hurst, Adernon, Nanushka, and many, many others. And I also want to give a special thanks to our advisory council. Thank you so much to our advisory council. They all came together over the last year to complete the protocol, which you will see today. So um, I just want to, again, send a, a, a huge uh, gratitude and appreciation to those who have contributed to the protocol across um, the last several years. We can go to the next slide, Julie. So just a reminder that attendees are in listen only mode and we welcome your questions. So type in your questions at any time into the chat and we will be addressing your questions and answering them at the end of toward the end of the webinar. And so again, thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Eon's head of sustainability and um, the person who has been managing the protocol into its completion over the last year, Julie Brown. Thank you so much, Annie. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's really great to see all of you in attendance here. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Julie Brown and I will be uh, talking about the protocol today and making sure that you're all aware of what it is. Um, and how it can be useful to your organizations. Uh, so we're going to next dig into an introduction to digital identification and to provide some context for this protocol. Uh, then we'll dig into why we need a circular product data protocol, protocol development, its context, and then you'll be able to get to hear from industry peers about uh, how they have participated in the creation of this protocol or how they intend to use it. And you will also have a chance to ask questions. Our panel will stay on uh, to answer any questions that you think of, and Annie will be coming back for those questions as well. So we are here today to tell you about the Circular Product Data Protocol. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated its launch. Uh, it is launched under a Creative Commons license, which means it is publicly available uh, uh, at, at free of cost um, for use. Um, and you can access it at circulardataprotocol.org. So we invite you to go ahead and download it today. And just as a little preview for what you can look forward to later in the call, uh, you will get to hear from industry partners, Gerard Himscher, uh, who is, works for the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, and will be speaking from a policy perspective. You'll also be hearing from Nicole Bassett, co-founder of the Renewal Workshop, who will be talking uh, about the benefits from a resale perspective. And you'll also be hearing from Naz Kazazoglu, who works for a Yuxnet Porte group. Uh, and we'll speaking about, be speaking about uh, digital identification from a brand perspective. So why does this exist? What problem is the protocol trying to resolve? Uh, today, when you buy an item, this tag, the hang tag that's on the item is cut off immediately. Uh, and there is a lot of helpful information on that tag. You can see certifications, you can see size, you can see maybe the article number and who knows what's behind that barcode. Uh, but as soon as that's cut off, all of that data is lost. It's no longer with the product. Uh, and 
what's more, even labels within the product, so on the product like the care, con the care label or the uh, material context, that could even be removed. Um, but this, this means that there's an overall loss of really important data that can be used for circular economy models. So the product can't be identified by circular partners. In order to try to identify some of this, uh, it can be very time consuming, it can be very costly, products could ultimately be undervalued, design intentions are lost, and there's no measurement, transparency, or accountability of those design intentions either, or circularity for that product. Over the past few years, I've seen a lot of really encouraging efforts for product circularity, designing for circularity, entering new business models and innovations. And that's fantastic, that's encouraging, but if there isn't data about the product and it's difficult to find out what it even is, that can be a real barrier to scale of those circular business models. So a solution is to digitize products with a shared language. This means creating a digital identity of a product with that data that's important about that product stored online and, and accessible to those who need it. So the protocol creates this shared language and it can help brands and retailers scale those circular business models because the data will still be available for them. It can unlock data essential for maximizing the value and recovery of products and materials, particularly for resale and recycling. It can bring transparency and accountability to the life cycle, and it can extend those sustainability investments. So if you're putting a lot of effort into designing for circularity, that can be realized. The Internet of Things is a technology that connects the physical and digital worlds. This is where those digital twins of products can be stored so that it can, you can see that data and maximize the value of product for the circular economy. So how does it work? Well, first there's a data carrier and the data carrier uh, is, a, could be a QR code, could be an, an RFID, could be an NFC that is embedded on the product. It's washable, it's durable, and it's accessible to those who need to see data. Then there's a system, a system that holds key material and product data. Um, so this stores key information about the identification of the product, of its materials, uh, about commerce, categorization, product attributes, anything that could be relevant for those different audiences. And the third critical component is that that data is accessible. So it can connect to each item for the circular economy. Recyclers, regenerators uh, could be able to access that information about the product to be able to identify it and its material context for those circular business models. But what is the data, right? What is this important information that needs to be tied to a product? And that is why we wrote the circular product data protocol. It defines the product that is essential to circular functions. And it ensures that that data can be communicated between parties in a consistent way. And it defines the formatting for that data to allow for interoperability between different systems. Okay, and I'm going to show a quick video introducing the protocol. Julie, we can't hear the audio. Okay. Try this again. How about now? It works. Fashion had a language. Whatever clothes could speak. There's a simple idea that could change the fashion industry from products to resources, from one life to many, from linear to circular. Today, only 1% of clothing is recycled. Even when a garment is designed with circularity in mind, many items are simply lost in the system. The design intention doesn't match the outcome. How can we change that? Digital identification is accelerating fashion's transition to circularity. Powerful tool that magnifies an invisible world in a second. A gateway to crucial information about the brands, materials, and stories behind every product. 
and a means to help resellers and recyclers maximize their value and recovery. The Circular Product Data Protocol creates a common language for identifying products across their life cycle, from production to use to resale and recycling. Today, it is available to you with free access under an open source license. Take a step towards a circular future and adopt now the language of tomorrow. Okay, so there's a quick introduction to the protocol. Uh, now I'll dig a little bit more into how it was developed. And it was through a lot of industry collaboration. Industry leadership really came together to figure out what this needs to look like, how it needs to be formatted, and what those really relevant data points are. Um, so here you can see the funding partners, brand and retail members, technology partners, knowledge partners, and pilot partners, as well as our advisory council. Today, the advisory council is responsible for any for maintaining the protocol after its launch. So, making sure there are um, that we respond to feedback, that we uh, we discuss it as a group and understand um, how what that might mean for the protocol. If there needs to be revisions, how the circularity landscape is changing in the industry, and how that needs to be reflected in the protocol, um, and how uh, we can help with the scale and alignment with policy advancements as well. Um, so that you can see there is a huge collaboration um, with really, uh, really great experts in the industry to help bring this to life. And we are so grateful for, for their participation. It was developed through an ICL standard setting practice. Uh, so there, that means that there were, um, there was this collaborative group. There were three different public comment periods. Uh, there was a pilot uh, with brands and retailers to to pilot different versions of the protocol and really understand what data points were adoptable um, and what uh, were most critical as well. Uh, and it was updated with the, that advisory council over the past year to finalize it and launch it in November, 2021. Throughout this process, it was also important to, uh, that there was alignment with standards. So we worked with partners at uh, HIG and the, at the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, with the UNECE, with Textile Exchange, and with GS1 to really understand what standards are, are already in use, what's already being adopted, what are companies already collecting data for, uh, and, and which could help with the adoption of, of the protocol as well. Um, so we made sure that there is alignment with these where relevant and, and where it's really important. There are two primary functions of the protocol. The first one is identification of products. And this is to support the continued use and circulation of products. So the people who are seeing the data about that identification of the product, the audience is going to be product recircular, recirculators, such as, as resellers. Uh, the second function is the identification of materials. And this is really to support the continued use and regeneration of materials. So the audience for that data will be material recyclers. The protocol outlines, most importantly, what the essential data is. So what are the data fields? Um, what do we mean by that? What's the definition? What's the rationale for including it? And is there any standard alignment? It also includes the actual structure of the data. So the format of it, the data type, the key, the, length, the character lengths. Uh, so it really gets into the details to help with this implementation uh, to really define those data points and, and make it a lot easier to adopt. Uh, it also includes implementation guidelines. So that, that's to get a, digging into the digital identification more with the um, data carrier, the system and the accessibility as well. Here's a list of the high level uh, data points that are collected. So the list could go on forever. There's a lot that, that you think of that you would want to include and, and it could be really long. What we tried to do here was boil it down to those that are most essential for the circular economy, for those uh, material uh, regenerators and the product recirculators. 
So what is most essential? We also had to, uh, we wanted to align with those other standards as much as possible. So for example, with product ID system, that might be a GTIN, and then you could enter the GTIN there. So that's, that's one way that we wanted to align with GS1. Um, we also uh, looked at the gender and age group and product category and saw, well, GS1 also has lists for those. For some other um, categories, uh, the HIG index might have another list that was used. So we were trying to align with these other standards as much as possible. Now, as the circular landscape changes, these will have to, um, these will be maintained as well. So making sure that if there's a, any kind of technology that's being scaled that doesn't allow a for a certain type of finish, for example, um, that's when we'll need to, to take a look at this and say, okay, are there any questions that need to be added? And the advisory council will, will be responsible for those revisions. It's also important to note that there's a difference between the protocol and the technology. The protocol itself is, it's this document that outlines the data needs. It is data carrier agnostic, whereas uh, the technology would be specifying that more, um, more. So it'd be the NFC, the RFID, the QR, et cetera. The protocol is specifying the data that should be stored, but it's not actually storing the data. That's the technology. And the protocol is recommending um, like the structure of data that should be included but it is not outlining any permissions around the accessibility of that data. Again, that's the technology. You may have seen uh, some exciting announcements recently. The Sustainable Markets Initiative Fashion Tax Force has uh, committed to using digital ID and they have also committed to using the circular product data protocol. So that's something that we're really excited about. I feel, you know, it's actually, actually being used in the real world. And so now I would like to invite our panelists to speak. Um, so Gerard, Nicole, and Naz, would you please um, uh, turn on your, your cameras and turn on your microphones? And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see each other. Hi, everyone. Hi, thank you so much for joining today. Um, so I'm going to go through and um, ask you all a few questions. Feel free to jump in and, and keep it an active conversation as well. Um, Nicole, let's start with you. Can you please introduce yourself and the Renewal Workshop? Hi, thanks for having me here today. Um, so Nicole Bassett, I'm one of the co-founders of the Renewal Workshop. Um, we work in the, the sort of post-consumer space for brands. Uh, we help brands take product that is not sellable, um, make it sellable again, and, and um, support in re-commerce re their products. Um, so we have uh, facilities in the U.S. and in Amsterdam where we uh, take products, clean, repair, uh, and make it available for sale. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, we're going to come back to you in a few minutes, but um, Naz, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Julie. Um, so I'm a business designer at UX Med Sports Day Group. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are an online luxury and fashion retailer that serve around 4.5 4 million customers globally. Um, and my focus in the business is on identifying and implementing new technologies or new business models that focus on kind of dramatic disruptive shifts in the industry in the near future. So yeah, Very excited exciting. To Great, thank you for joining us. And Gerard, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, uh, first, uh, good morning uh, to everyone uh, on the call or evening or afternoon. I don't know which time zone everyone is, but and thank you, uh, Julie, for uh, the invitation uh, to be a panelist uh, in this uh, webinar. So I'm Garrett Heimskerk and I'm a project member of the UNEC Sustainable Textile and Leather Traceability and Transparency Project. Within this project, I am the data modeling expert and responsible for development and maintenance of all data requirements, ensuring uh, alignment with the UN library and other UN 
reference points by this ensuring consistency of language and definition. All right, thank you very much. That's um, Gerard is also on our advisory council. So this data expertise has been very helpful in the finalization of the protocol. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the project that you're working on at the UNECE? Yes, uh, my, my expertise is now being used uh, for the uh, textile and uh, leather project uh, mentioned earlier. The um, UNECE initiative has been uh, launched in 2019 with support of the European Commission and in partnerships with, with the International Trade Center. This initiative relies on a network of 250 accredited UNCFIC experts that have participated in, an, in the open consultation for the project uh, deliverables. So far, the project has developed uh, a recommendation, guidelines, and electronic uh, business standards. All project uh, deliverables are published on our website, downloadable, free of charge. As a proof of concept, we have piloted uh, traceability and transparency for the cotton value chain and are now starting with the leather value chain, um, followed by the other ones, uh, such as uh, wool. Uh, within the blockchain pilot, we are addressing the negative health, social, and environment impacts of textile and leather operations. The blockchain pilot now involves, involves 60 partners from brands uh, down to cotton farms and service providers, including those for DNA markers from 15 countries with 20 use cases for traceability and assets, for traceable assets, sorry, such as uh, shirts, jeans, and, and bags. Um, to add trustworthiness to the collected evidences for traceability and transparency, such as trade documents and certificates, all evidences are checked by another party also known as the 4i principle before putting the data on the blockchain and that's in short what the product is is about is quite quite large that is all right thank, thank you. you i i have lots more questions but we'll come back to that i'm going to um also ask uh nas um can you explain why you think the product the digital identification brings value to your product in your company yeah, of course. Um, so we started experimenting with Digital ID last year because we think it's a key technology, key enabler for circularity. Um, so we started digitizing four of our private label collections. Um, and we were, I think, one of the first in the luxury and fashion industry to do so at the scale. Um, and why we think is valuable is basically exactly what you said. Right now in the industry, we don't have a way, a standardized way to uniquely identify a apparel product. And we don't have a way to share data and exchange data after the point of sale. Um, so by digitizing our products, we basically join this, create this common language between the brand, the retailer, the reseller, repair, recycler, so on and so forth and really unlock that potential of circularity. So that's one way to look at it from a protocol perspective. And obviously um, we are also using the idea as a technology to help um, our customers shift their mindset towards longevity. So we're using digital ID to offer services and information around can repair, styling, um, resale, so on and so forth, so that we could educate the customer to become more kind of longevity oriented, value oriented when they use and take care of their pieces. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good point because we've talked about how the protocol uh, is really meant for these recyclers and, and, and recirculators, but the digital ID itself has this consumer aspect as well, where you can, can dig into the longevity or care. Um, and Nicole, 
Um, can you uh, tell us about what's your current sorting process and what are some of the challenges that that you run into? Yeah, so um, because we're uh, at the early stages of trying to create a circular economy, all of the uh, the systems that we have really are built. Um, we're not built for, hey, I have I see value in where something should go next. So when we receive product from our brand partners, usually it's um, boxes of unknown or gaylords or trucks of unknown things that are coming to us. Uh, so our sort process is pretty, uh, pretty, I mean, it is completely manual where we're having to touch the item and look at it and say, is this renewable or does it need, is it too foregone, too damaged? It needs to go to its next use. And um, so one of the big, big key things that we learned at the beginning was, uh, uh, well, I guess my, I'll say it differently. One of our first assumptions was, oh, the customer doesn't care or it doesn't matter. I can just sell you this brown sweater size medium because that's information that I can see from the product. And once we started going out into market, consumers pushed back pretty quickly and they're like, yeah, but but which sweater is that? And, and what was the original price? And what is its features and benefits? And what was this information? Um, and that really spawned the, like, for us, the, the, the direct experience of, of like, oof, we need a digital ID, <laughs> like we need this really badly. Um, so we've created a few processes with our brand partners to access their data. We are actually having to um, put the ID on the product itself at our facility and basically start the process from that moment, whereas what we are really excited about this protocol and the direction the industry is going, just as Naz said, start at the beginning and then we'll pick that product up later down in the process. So our challenge is that it is currently, we're dealing with products that were never designed to go on to next uses. And so we're creating processes that really don't need to be created if we design products to be more digital. And I have a picture that you sent me that I yeah. want to pull up. Um, can you speak to this? Yeah, so I, I I just took a picture of the jacket I was wearing, um, which is, is actually kind of an old jacket. Uh, and you can see here that there is a, a whole bunch of information that's been printed on this tag. We've got icons, we've got text, we've got numbers. You can see that there's this Prima Loft like marketing piece on this, on this um, product. Right now you can imagine, how do I access that information? You, like it's a person typing these things in. I mean, we have some ways around working with the brand directly, so it's not that case, but you can see what we're unlocking and when we move to digital, because right now this is how we transfer information. That seems incredibly time consuming. <laughs> Um, and so what opportunities does the circular product data protocol provide for you? Right, you it's going to be, yeah. So I, I, my big hope is that, um, that brands that we would receive product with digital ID on it, and it would allow us to shorten our processing time, um, and also remove human error. So you, you know, O's and zeros look very similar to each other. A's and fours can look similar to each other, especially when things get rubbed off. So there's this ability to start to um, make the uh, re-commerce repair side of the business a lot more efficient if this information is being provided to us in a digital, in a digital way. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I have a couple more questions that I'll come back to you. Um, Gerard, uh, can you tell us um, what opportunities you see alignment between the circular product data protocol and the work that you're doing with UN? Yes, of course. Um, alignment uh, just uh, empowers consumers to make their consumption choices uh, better. So because sustainability uh, and circularity claims uh, are more reliable. Uh, by joining uh, the project of E.ON, we gained more knowledge on the post-consumption uh, uh, stage. And we have uh, tested in our blockchain uh, pilot the use of, uh, the use case, sorry, of recycled uh, denim, which uh, became input material for the spinner. And yes, uh, by offering standardized data to 
recyclers, resellers, repairers, and consumers, we all will be able to reduce the use of new resources, stimulate the reuse of products, and uh, decline uh, landfills. With respect to the uh, protocol, much work has been uh, done on the creation of sound definitions and the rationale behind each data point. Alignment with the protocol, at least uh, on the semantic level, will certainly speed up the uh, circular uh, economy. Yesterday, uh, a new UNC effect project has been uh, launched to work on the use case for product uh, circularity, taking into account the protocol and the EU digital product passport. So that's, that's great news. That is excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, we've been hearing a lot about um, uh, the work with the European Commission lately too, with the digital product passport. Can you speak about how this, your work relates to that and how um, the protocol could relate to that or, or how it's different? Yes, yes. The, the European uh, Union will start in, in 2023 with the gradual deployment of the digital product passport in minimum three value chains, electronics, batteries, and at least one other value chain, possibly uh, textile, textiles. A preliminary list of data contains now 14 families of attributes, such as recycled content, chemical content, recycling instructions. The development of the digital passport could benefit from the developed circular product data protocol. Both the product, sorry, both the protocol and the digital product passport are standardized and open digital solutions for identification and sharing of product data. The main difference is that the digital product passport is aiming for a common data set to enable cross industry use, though the protocol is contextualized for the textile and leather sector. That's what I see as the main difference. Okay, thank you for explaining that. What, what I'm hoping is that these, um, the protocol can, it, it seems like the timing of its launch was, was good in terms of being able to support the work going on with yes. you at the UN. And yes, exactly. Yes. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, Nas, can you uh, talk a little bit more about the kind of benefit that you expect to see from digital IDs and how it, it uh, ties in with your circularity strategy at Euxnenda Porte Group? Yeah, sure thing. Um, maybe I'll take the second question first. So sure. um, in terms of our sustainability strategy, we have launched Infinity, which is our 2030 sustainability strategy uh, last year. It's publicly available on our corporate site, wineup.com. And a big part of it really focuses on circularity. So whether this is about how we design our private labels, what kind of responsible materials we use, or the, what kind of enhanced technologies we use in it. So that's all kind of covered by our circularity strategy. Another layer of it is also inviting our customers to join this um, kind of circular journey of products. And a good example of that is our resale initiative. We recently launched with Reflant in the UK with Nesporte. Um, it's gonna be soon available in the US as well. And uh, we're also looking to launch Mr. Porter and the Outnet next year. So big focus on resale. And we see Digital ID really as kind of like a connector point between these different initiatives we have. So let's say if we're using recycled materials, how could we um, talk about this to 
our customers at Digital ID is a perfect place as a technology for that. Or if you are investing in resale and the circular lifecycle of our products, could Digital ID and Circular ID protocol act as a language to make sure that our, um, our products are circulated properly? So it's kind of deeply embedded into um, different, different things we do. Um, I'm also personally really, really interested about the data element. So the more um, companies that we have down the chain that is able to scan get the information and give us back the information. Then we start learning about the journey of our products beyond our warehouses and our, and our kind of order history, as in like, are they being used, reused, reshared, recycled properly, when, for how much, where do they end up? So all of these um, questions are really, really interesting for us from a circularity perspective, almost being able to track um, the success of our, all of these strategies and efforts that we're doing. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about that too. It's, um, that's another part that, that I hadn't really spoken to is the technology piece of this will actually be able to track. Yeah. What happens to that? It was, it resold, uh, is it, is it recycled? And so you're able to, yeah, measure the success of your programs in that way. And especially as we're talking about policy with Gerard here, who knows what requirements will be, um, will be in place in the future. Um, so hopefully this can this is something that can really help with that. Um, and what does your the big question that always comes to mind is like, well, how do you do this? <laughs> so what does your implementation process internally like? What does that look like? Yeah, very good question. Um, I wasn't really sure about how that's going to go either at the beginning. I was like, okay, we're going into this. Um, basically, very simply, it's a new step and a couple couple of new steps in your manufacturing process so how does it work is that eon works very closely with your buying and merchandising teams and design teams and you identify a moment in the manufacturing journey let's say when the buy is confirmed when the styles are confirmed to say okay these products will be digitized so then you use the circular id data protocol to say um, basically all the important information about that product to Eon. And then Eon basically takes that and is able to create serialized unique IDs for each garment, work with your trim supplier to make sure that the labels are printed and packed properly, sent to your um, manufacturers of the final garment and they can like sew it in basically to the right garment. So the whole process is the input that you have is really giving providing that information and that can come from your PLM system or the systems and, and tools that you currently use to Eon um, and under the water I feel like there's a lot uh, you guys have done at Eon to really make sure that process is seamless um, and basically once you set it up it's fairly easier to then let's say do it again in the next collections while at the beginning it's obviously kind of a slight change in the process. Um, so that was our experience with it. Interesting. Thank you for explaining. Um, all right, and Nicole, can you? Um, how do you know? You know, we hear we we're hearing a lot about how it how to gather this data now. Also, how you plan to use the data? How do you know that those data points are going to be what you need? Yeah. So um, the renewal workshops actually been part of the process even before it became um, an official process. Uh, um, I want to say five or five or six years ago, um, Natasha, Annie, and I had talked a lot about like, well, what data are you collecting and why are you collecting it and what's relevant for resale and what's relevant for repair and what do you need to know? Um, so we, we gave input early into the process. And then as our business evolved over time and our brand partners evolved over time and the needs of the market evolved over time, we've been involved in each one of the um, open comments um, and provided feedback on the protocol and being able to see also what was very fascinating is what was important to other stakeholders in the process. And for us to be like, oh, I don't care about that data and then realizing like why it's important to a different stakeholder. <laughs> uh, so Nas gave a bunch of great examples of why like from a brand and designer perspective, that's really important. Um, so um, yeah, we've, we've been um, along the process. We've made sure that it, it works for us, but also for our brand partners uh, to make sure that this is the right data that we're gonna need to be successful with our business ongoing. Got it. Well, thank you so much for your participation in that. And that was, yeah, incredibly valuable and definitely helps make sure that the 
that the protocol is meeting those needs. Um, Gerard, speaking of now thinking more, looking into the future, um, we know that the protocol will need to be maintained and go through go through updates. We're expecting um, this one to last for about three years, um, but then there will probably need to be revisions just based on where policy is and where um, where where the industry is at that point. Can you um, tell us about the advisory council role a little bit more and and how you participate on that? Yes, yes, of course. Um, at, at UNC, in fact, it, it's a subsidiary of uh, UNECE. We develop standards uh, for information exchange by executing a process called the open development process. In other words, we are used to collaborate and discuss new requirements. And the protocol governed by the uh, advisory council ensures alignment between the protocol and other in initiatives. So for UNECE, alignment with other initiatives such as the protocol is important. Uh, as mentioned, we just started uh, yesterday a new uh, project on uh, product circularity. Uh, for this reason, I, I joined the advisory council uh, and in, in simple words, collaboration and harmonization uh, will ensure interoperability between systems and at the same time supporting a sustainable and uh, circular economy. And, and that's um, how I see it. We, we should collaborate, we should listen uh, to each other, um, we should align between different standards. Uh, this uh, economy uh, circular, so to speak. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for, for your continued service and support on the Advisory Council. Nicole, again, thank you for your contributions over the past few years. And Naz, thank you so much for piloting this and help us figure out how it can be you know, more adoptable for brands. Um, I would like to, uh, to open it up to questions from the audience. Annie, if you would like to join us, please do. And Annie, it looks like you answered a bunch um, online already. Thank you for that. Let us know if there's any that you think would be relevant for, for everybody. Um, but uh, one question uh, for, for Gerard, can you um, share a link to read more about what the, what was, what was launched or can you just speak more about what was launched yesterday? Uh, yes, it's, I can uh, perhaps uh, provide you with the, um, the link. Can I put it in the in the chat? Uh, I think so. Or you can chat it to me, and I might be able to. Okay. It's. Um, or if you can just speak about it now, then we can. Yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, one second, please. And while he while he looks for that link, Julie. Yes. There were some questions here that I indicated that we would answer live. Oh, so great. About six and you can find them and it does say answered, but they were such great questions. I thought we could answer them in the webinar. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so the one question is, do you want full ingredient transparency? If yes, till which level? As mostly even the smallest inclusion of a certain ingredient can cause difficulties with recycling. So how is how is that addressed? Annie, would can, you like to take this one? Yeah, I can answer this one. So that's a great question. Thank you for whoever contributed this question. Um, I think it's important to point out how we went about the process here. When we kicked off, um, we kicked off in 2018, but the work that's been done toward the protocol actually happened many, many years before that. And so um, I, I, had been in my previous role, I had been working with all of the chemical recyclers um, at the time who were chemical recyclers like Renew a Cell and Warren Again and Evernew. And there was a huge group of them who were sort of coming up in the fashion industry scene. 
And um, we incorporated their needs in the process of the protocol development because we were involved with them as they were trying to figure out how to scale their technologies, not from a the um, not from the standpoint of the chemistry aspect, but from the standpoint of being able to get them um, being able to provide them with the essential identification of the materials to match their specifications. So the way that we began was to in basically in two categories, and you'll see if you um, look at the protocol or download the protocol, there are two categories from encouraged to highly encouraged. And at this time, the protocol mainly focuses on material composition and some deeper elements like trims, for example, um, well, a sewing yarn isn't a trim, but trims and sewing yarn, because those um, fields that are in the protocol represent the, the easiest, most essential, most impactful fields that the recyclers need today. We know that we are going to get to the point of um, the bill of materials in the future. Um, so we know that's going to happen, right? At this time, there's two parts that we need to consider. What's gonna be the most impactful for the recyclers and what's gonna be feasible for brands to provide that data. And that is a beautiful balance that we incorporated throughout the development of the protocol. So the fields that you see there today are going to be the most impactful for recyclers over the next few years. That was a very long winded answer. I hope it was very helpful. Thanks, Annie. Um, have you thought about thought of including the number of previous owners of the garment or the date manufactured? Another one for me. Probably go to yeah to you, Annie or Nicole, as part of the process. If you remember these conversations, I can speak to this one. So one of the things that Julie shared um, in the presentation was the sort of the difference between the protocol and the difference between the technology, and Eon. So. Eon has, uh, as you all know, we have a we have a technology platform, and so we also led the group in developing the protocol. So there's there's basically a line between the protocol and the technology platform. In the protocol today, we the protocol what the protocol does include is the most essential information for recyclers and resellers to value product and to sell product and to identify product. So the previous owners aren't included in that scope right now. However, I will say that that's something that Eon is incorporating through our technology. So some technology partners and some IoT partners are incorporating, incorporating that level of information in a variety of ways. The data manufacturer, um, many, the data manufacturing, I believe, is included in the protocol. Is that right, Julie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, Garrett, I have a question for you. Um, do you anticipate that the protocol will support policy creation internationally, as well as an uptick for funding for circularity projects like recycling programs? And you're on mute. Okay. Um... Can you repeat the, the question, please? Yeah, yeah. Do you anticipate that the protocol will support policy creation internationally, as well as an uptick in funding for circularity projects like recycling programs? The last part about funding, um, I'm I'm not the person to ask. Um, so uh, that's uh, something. Uh, that should be addressed to the uh, UNECE Secretariat. And uh, the, the first part about uh, policy in the future, uh, in, in, in the first place, the, the standard, there are uh, global standards as, as uh, we anticipate with the UN. Um, in this case, uh, for the uh, textile and uh, uh, leather industry, but 
the components we are using for this standard um, are coming from our UN library and are kept as uh, generic uh, uh, as possible. And uh, the implementation uh, is then uh, more contextualized to the uh, textile and leather industry. So um, we have a global scope, and uh, but uh, it, it are uh, industry groups that, that create and, and contextualize those, those standards. So, yeah. and aligning with uh, the work of, of uh, done for the circular uh, product data protocol is, is, is to align as much as possible with the, the global uh, uh, initiative uh, we are going to start on, on this subject. And that's the same for other standards. So aligning is, is at, 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 at the um, semantic level is, is, is very important. Definitely, that kind of creates a good foundation. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, Naz, I have a question for you. Um, how can a brand use the protocol plus authentication solution plus pr proprietary code to control and monetize the consumer engagement experience? Awesome, so a lot of questions in there. Um, basically, authentication, all of these things can be layered on top of the tech stack that Digital ID offers today, let's say. An easiest way to monetize um, the experience today is obviously offering conscious upselling up opportunities. So you could be like, hey, you purchased this sweater two years ago. What about maybe trading it in for this new one? Or you could pair it with this to make it look more fresh. So there are things that you could do uh, from like a fashion brand perspective to obviously monetize it. Other, um, when, when you talk about authenticity, that's also a very, very big topic that requires probably a webinar on its own, but it will really tie to the physical um, identifier that you use. So is it NFC, is it QR code, is it, something else so the authenticity discussion is really closely connected i feel to the physical identifier qr codes do supply some of that but not um as secure as we would maybe love to at this stage so um it's definitely one to watch um it's a big opportunity for um connected products in the future to be for a customer to be able to buy something and say I'm going to be able to authenticate it. I'm going to be able to prove that this is authentic to you in, in resale market. So that's going to massively help for businesses that have this authentication um, reading capability to be able to say, okay, then maybe I'm going to offer you a better price on resale. So there's definitely commercial opportunities there as well. Um, let me know if that answered um, the question more or less. And if there are anything is missing, feel free to jump sure. in. I think that's great. Thank you so much, Naz. I think we have time for one more. And I think, Annie, this probably goes to you. Um, what initiatives can be taken to segregate data between the end consumer and the manufacturer, um, mm -hmm. such as sensitive product data that should only be visible to the manufacturer? Right. That's a that's a really good question. And the answer to this is going to relate to what Naz also just shared. The thing to remember about the protocol is it's a data it is a data protocol with a very specific intention. The specific intention is to help brands um, know exactly what data needs to be embedded in the digital ID to ensure that product is valued to its highest degree post point of sale, right? And so it is a data protocol. It defines those data fields. It is not a technology solution. And so what you all want to do is find a technology partner that is able to segment the um, the visibility of that data to different audiences. Okay, so that's something that Eon is set up to do, along with other technology partners. So what Eon does is it's a it's basically a holder of that data. The Eon platform holds that data, right? It's an it's an IoT solution that enables the ability for that data to be visible 
to a variety of different audiences because your consumer experience you don't you don't want Nicole over at renewal workshop to look at the consumer experience that's not what she wants she wants the data right and so the manufacturer is going to is going to have visibility into another data field so the idea here is to work with a technology partner eon's one of them right so we've created this ability ability to bring some data forward but not all of the data and that's how we work with brands right we work with brands to ensure that that data is segmented properly exactly different relevant points for different audiences um Okay, I think that is all we have time for today, but thank you so much to our panelists and to Annie for helping us with those questions. If we didn't get to your question, um, I, I, uh, I, if you're not in, and you're not anonymous, I can follow up. We also uh, have a, a form in, in our um, website, circulardataprotocol.org, to where you can continue to ask your questions and we will be able to respond. Thank you so much for joining today. We're so glad we got the opportunity to tell you about the Circular Product Data Protocol, and we hope you check it out at circulardataprotocol.org. Um, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.